Okay, very nice. I think I'm going, I, we are on Facebook right now. I'm going to introduce you to, to the audience, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos nuevamente. Estamos en un webinario de la Asociación Mexicana de Ultrasonografía Crítica y Urgencias. Sean ustedes bienvenidos a estas actividades que les hemos llamado webinarios y que en este año tenemos varias de ellas muy interesantes. Así que eh, pues no, no, no pierdan contacto con nuestro grupo, con nuestra asociación, porque tenemos muchísimas actividades pendientes. Tenemos desde luego cursos, tenemos no nada más estas conferencias en línea, sino también tenemos diversas actividades, muchas de ellas que, que estoy seguro les serán de utilidad, como los cursos que hacemos de accesos vasculares, como el curso que se aproxima de ultrasonido cardíaco enfocado, en fin, muchas otras actividades que tenemos planeadas para este año y entre ellas eh, estamos ahora tratando de, de implementar algunas actividades para grupos específicos, como lo es el caso de las actividades para médicos especialistas en medicina interna, tratarles ahora de, de llevar, en este caso específico, una conferencia acerca del ultrasonido Point of Care, específicamente para médicos internistas. Estoy seguro que muchos de ustedes les será de gran utilidad, pues tenemos en este momento una invitada muy especial, una gran entusiasta del ultrasonido con muchas actividades importantes sobre el área de la educación allá en Canadá, que en un momento les voy, a, les voy a presentar. Pero antes de presentárselas y pasar a nuestro webinario, quiero también darle la bienvenida al doctor Pavel Aguilera desde Guadalajara, Jalisco, quien es también miembro de nuestra asociación, quien es miembro de nuestro grupo. Él está encargado también de varias actividades específicas, como él es el curso de accesos vasculares. Y actualmente, ya, ya nos platicarás, Pavel, pero también estamos planeando hacer un curso dirigido a médicos internistas. Es por eso que lo, que lo invitamos en esta ocasión para que comparta sus comentarios, su experiencia y que participe con nosotros en este webinario. ¿Cómo estás, Pavel, desde Guadalajara? Gracias por acompañarnos. Muy bien, muy bien, Juan. Muchas gracias por, por la invitación. Y desde luego quiero aprovechar esto para felicitarte. Lo hago público. Eh, todos los miembros de AMUSCO estamos orgullosos y muy contentos de tu trabajo. Creo que es digno de admiración y sin lugar a dudas nos da mucho gusto que cada vez más los compañeros, los colegas se están acercando a, a nosotros. Creo que esta actividad académica está realizando en tu tercera temporada ya de webinarios, pues merece, merece todo nuestro reconocimiento. Y efectivamente, pues estamos contentos de que la doctora Irene esté con nosotros Creo que va a ser de mucho provecho para todos los que estemos en esta, en esta reunión virtual. Me da también gusto, ya tenemos 23 participantes activos en este momento. Un saludo para todos ellos. Estoy seguro que muchos de ellos son médicos internistas que estarán ansiosos en algún momento de tener un contacto, si no es que ya lo tienen, con, con esta herramienta que es fundamental y que ha venido a romper paradigmas en cuanto a la atención de nuestros pacientes en la práctica médica cotidiana. Muchas gracias por la invitación, Juan, y desde luego le agradezco a la doctora Irene que esté con nosotros. Así es, Pavel, ¿no? Pues al contrario, gracias a ti. Y pues bueno, tenemos eh, desde luego a una invitada muy especial desde Calgary, Canadá. Ella se encuentra en la Universidad de Calgary y ella, como les comentaba, ha estado liderando muchos trabajos de investigación. Es una experta en lo que es la educación, desde luego también virtual. Y bueno, pues ella, como ustedes saben, eh, recientemente se publicó un consenso sobre un grupo que, que, que tienen ellos allá en Canadá sobre, de médicos internistas, específicamente algunas recomendaciones, algunos, eh, digamos, algunos puntos de vista sobre el ultrasonido Point of Care en Medicina Interna, que desde luego les, les invitamos a que lo lean, a que lo, a que lo revisen, puesto que ahí se, se explican muchos de los tópicos que se toman en el ultrasonido Point of Care y que en esta ocasión pues, son muy útiles para los médicos internistas. Como bien menciona Pavel, pues tenemos eh, médicos internistas eh, prácticamente en México y en toda Latinoamérica que estoy seguro estarán atentos y les será de gran utilidad este tipo de, de actividades y desde luego lo que es en sí la herramienta del ultrasonido Point of Care. Así pues, les voy a ahora sí a presentar a nuestra invitada, la doctora Irene Ma, que como ustedes, como les hemos estado comentando, ella se encuentra actualmente en Calgary, Canadá. Ella es jefa de división de la área de medicina interna ahí en la Universidad de Calgary y pues ha aceptado gentilmente nuestra invitación con mucho entusiasmo 
con mucho entusiasmo para compartir sus experiencias sobre el área del ultrasonido Point of Care dirigido exclusivamente y específicamente a médicos internistas. Estoy seguro que les será de gran interés y pues bienvenidos sean todos eh, nuestros amigos mexicanos y latinoamericanos de Perú, Brasil, Bolivia, Ecuador, etcétera, de muchas partes de, de Latinoamérica y también del mundo que nos hacen favor de escucharnos. Así que demos de la bienvenida a la doctora Irene Mann. Irene Ma desde Canada. Thank you so much, Irene. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are really honored and we are very, very happy for having you. Uh, we, are, uh, we are very, very interested for hearing you about this specific topic in uh, about ultrasound, point, point of care ultrasound in internal medicine. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Irene. Uh, thank you so much and let's get started with your conference. Perfect. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak, Dr. Calderon. I'm very excited to talk about point of care for uh, ultrasound for internal medicine. It really is one of my favorite topics, and I think there's a lot of uh, value in, in uh, further um, involving uh, and in expanding this. So just to kind of go over what I'm going to talk about over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, there are three things I really want to cover is number one, why should internists use point of care ultrasound? And from here on, I'm going to often refer to point of care ultrasound as POCUS, which is the common term most people are probably familiar with. The second thing I do want to comment on are what are the common barriers for internists not using ultrasound? And Lastly, I want to end the talk on what are the ways that we can integrate POCUS into the practice of internal medicine. So I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So let's go over our first topic. Why should internists use point of care ultrasound? I think first and foremost, as an internist, it really is extremely helpful in providing additional data points. Prior to the use of POCUS, if we were to say examine a patient for congestive heart failure, really our data points, at least on a physical examination, would be limited to the following. We might look at the neck veins for distension of the jugular venous uh, jugular vein. We may listen bilaterally for the presence of crackles. If we're lucky, we may be able to detect an S3 on auscultation and we may find edema on physical examination. And certainly, as you know, these findings can, it's, can be supportive of the presence of congestive heart failure, but not necessarily specific. With point of care ultrasound, however, our ability to have additional information now involves the following. If we were to evaluate the patient bilaterally um, over the lung zones, we may see the presence of bilateral B lines. Not uncommonly, we may also see a small amount of pleural effusion. This is the spine, this is the liver here, and this is the hypoechoic area would be pleural effusion with a bit of atelectasis or consolidated lung underneath. And if we were to look at the uh, cardiac ultrasound, we would be able to see that the contractility, at least in the systolic function issue, um, we would be able to detect that the cardiac function is not optimal in our patient. Um, and certainly, at least as far as point of care is concerned, we generally don't rest on a single view. So we would get a second view of the heart. And here is a parasternal short axis. What we're looking at here is the left ventricle with the papillary muscles and the right ventricle over here. And again, this confirms our initial suspicion that maybe the contractility of our patient is not optimal. If we were to look at uh, the IVC, for instance, we might also then see that the internal, uh, the, the uh, inferior vena cava is distended and plethoric in, um, on examination. So in addition to our physical examination, now we have additional data points to really help us confirm our initial impression that the patient might have congestive heart failure. Now, that's only one diagnosis. Um, sepsis is a very, very common condition that we see on, in our internal medicine patient. And here on the top left here, if we were to evaluate for a source of sepsis, we may then be able to see findings such as these. And here is an evidence where this is a spine over here, um, a diaphragm over here, 
And then this hypoechoic uh, pleural effusion is fairly evident that the patient has a, a fair amount of loculation that's, uh, that's seen there. And when confronted with this, we know that antibiotics alone is not going to be the sole answer to help our patient, that really this, this uh, area does need to be trained. In addition, top right here is evidence of consolidation. This is a lung with air bronchograms. And again, if seeing consolidation may assist us in ensuring that our antibiotics coverage in the setting of sepsis would uh, be, be covering a pulmonary source. Well, this is a little bit beyond point of care in the ultrasound of the heart, if we were to see what we can see here is a subcostal, apical, a subcostal four chamber view, right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium here, what we can see is that uh, um, a vegetation on the tricuspid valve will lead us sooner to the uh, uh, suspicion that the patient has endocarditis. And in this last panel here on the bottom right, I have a patient with uh, pancreatitis um, that has very slowly uh, resolving, a non-resolving white count and a, a lowish blood pressure. It's sometimes difficult to know when the patient needs further um, imaging or therapeutic intervention. And in this case here, by putting the probe on the patient, we're able to identify that this here is the liver. And what we have is actually loculations within the free fluid of the abdomen um, and this patient needed uh, a surgical intervention. Again, bowel rest alone wasn't going to do the trick. So these are all so only some of the ways that uh, ultrasound has helped the practice of internal medicine. Is it unstudied? Well, no, this is a uh, data from Milan whereby they used point of care ultrasound to identify the source of infection in septic patients. And here what they did was that they would um, go in and see the patient, obtain a history, physical examination. They would have a bacterial blood gas um, investigations and then lactate values on their patients. And then they come up with a clinical impression as to where the source of sepsis might be for their patients. The sensitivity coming out of that interaction would be approximately 48% and the specificity was 86%. These patients are then subjected to a point of care ultrasound uh, assessment, which may include any or all of the following, lung scans, abdominal scans, cardiac joint assessments, soft tissue, and they would do the scans that would be indicated on their patients, which is how point of care ultrasound which should be used. With the additional uh, use of POCUS, their sensitivity increased by 25% to 73%, and the specificity also increased to 95%. What is helpful to know is that while you can increase the sensitivity and specificity, by no means are they coming out and saying your sensitivity and specificity is now 100%. I'll come back to this a little bit later on because I think sometimes people expect POCUS to be more than it is, but really what it is is an extremely helpful tool that can allow us to be better clinicians. So the, as I indicated earlier, the number one for me, the number one reason to use point of care ultrasound is for additional data points. Using it to guide procedure, I don't think it's too contentious. Most of us would agree that we shouldn't be sticking needles into the patient without ability to visualize where we're sticking in the needles. So for the use of um, using ultrasound to guide central line insertion, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence has endorsed that from quite a few years ago. British Thoracic Society has also endorsed this use for guiding thoracentesis. So those are not really contentious areas. In the use of um, using ultrasound to guide paracentesis, it's completely changed my practice, for instance. So here is an abdominal wall, um, and you can see the, the muscle layers, and what you can see is ascites underneath with bowel loops floating down. I've used a linear transducer to really increase my ability to see what's within the abdominal wall, and putting a Doppler can help me identify the presence of vessels that I would definitely want to avoid in doing paracentesis. 
a similar sentiment is now recognized um, by the Society of Hospital Medicine that supported, a, uh, that issued a, a statement in support of use of ultrasound for abdominal paracentesis procedures. And um, last year, they also endorsed it in a uh, position statement for use of ultrasound guidance for thoracentesis. So I think going forward as internists, many of our procedures really should be guided by imaging um, and more specifically by ultrasound. The third reason I use ultrasound is really to help improve our physical examination skills. Um, I'm not gonna go over too much of what people are already doing uh, with ultrasound to improve our physical exam. I'll have additional examples later on in my talk here. But I would argue that sometimes we need to think about creative ways to do, use ultrasound to support what we do at the bedside. Here's an article that my trainee uh, and our group wrote up uh, fairly recently by placing a hand in the water bath and imaging through the water bath with an ultrasound transducer. What we can see is that we can actually quantify clubbing a little bit better. So in the top panel, uh, top right label B is a patient with clubbing. And this is what the nail profile would look like. ABC would refer, um, ABC here would refer to the uh, nail profile and this is the hyponychial profile. And using an online protractor, you can actually measure the angles more exactly. This is a, a normal patient without clubbing. This is what the nail bed would look like. And I think that um, the ability to better visualize our ultrasound findings can allow us to be a bit more exact in the science that we do. The fourth reason for using ultrasound um, as, as internists, we do a lot of teaching at the bedside and ultrasound is absolutely fantastic as an educational tool. For instance, in palpating, the thyroid examination, for instance. Oftentimes our, patient, our learners don't necessarily even know where the thyroid is. And it's not uncommon that before ultrasound, our learners are palpating very high up in the neck where the thyroid gland actually isn't even located. However, with the use of um, ultrasound, we can then place the transducer here. What I have at the bottom is a, a transverse image of the right lobe of the thyroid uh, with the thyroid over here carotid artery, um, and then the muscular structures over top. When we place the transducer at the top of the gland, uh, sorry, over here at the top of the gland, when we ask our patient to swallow as part of our physical maneuver, physical examination maneuver, it became more evident to learners that the gland moves up and down, and therefore the large bulk of the gland would ascend up as the patient swallows, as illustrated by the, the uh, video clip here. And here you can see the gland enlarges right there as the patient takes a swallow. So as an educational tool to explain the maneuvers that we do at the bedside on a day-to-day -day basis, I really ha have a hard time finding a better tool to illustrate some of these concepts. So I've given us a, a number of really good reasons why we should um, use ultrasound at the bedside as an internist. I can go on forever to tell you the truth, but let's go over some of the barriers of why internists aren't using ultrasound. Access to machine and money has traditionally been listed as a common barrier. Um, and I think, however, that this barrier is likely to going to be less common as time goes on. Um, nowadays, the machines are cheaper and more portable there are also additional ways of obtaining machines, including not just a purchasing model, you can also purchase used models, you can lease them. And in addition, you can, there, there are companies that would rent uh, the machines or transducers. And many of you may have heard about the new device that uses instead of crystals, uses a silicon chip, and that has dramatically decreased the price of these units down, such that I think as a barrier, machine access is not going to be as much of a problem coming, uh, going forward. Time, on the other hand, is always gonna be a bit of a problem for a lot of internists uh, as an issue of why they aren't using point of care ultrasound. 
uh, Daniel Lichtenstein, uh, father of lung ultrasound, uh, came up with the BLUE protocol. Um, this is a protocol used uh, to assess patients in acute respiratory failure, and it involves looking for B lines, A lines, um, looking at the, the leg veins, looking at uh, for evidence of consolidation, et cetera. And this protocol um, really takes less than three minutes to perform. So per time involved in doing ultrasound probably isn't as big of an issue as most people think it might be. In addition, what I do in my practice is that I also take a history while I'm doing the ultrasound as well. So sometimes I actually find out a lot more about my patient because I'm spending so much time at the bedside, you know, interacting with our patients. So I think, you know, you can make your time a bit more efficient. Having said that, time learning the technique is an issue, and I'm not going to downplay that it does require appropriate training. We all know ultrasound is very operator dependent, but it doesn't mean that it's not a learnable skill. In fact, it's extremely learnable. What I'm illustrating here is uh, issues with technique. If I have an IVC, inferior vena cava, in long axis, this is my transducer obtaining in long axis. If my transducer isn't exactly at midline, um, if I'm slid off the center, potentially my measurements could be an underestimation of the patient's true IVC. So you can see here on the, on the, um, on the bottom here what the IVC is thought to look like. But if I only spent the additional time really perfecting my technique and really evaluating for the true axis, you discover that actually the real IVC, it's larger than what it initially appeared to be. And that was only because of poor technique. Certainly there are ways to kind of get around that. I mean, for one, you can, you can improve your technique by ensuring that um, you, you spend the time to look for the, the true axis. And secondarily, you should probably image everything in two planes that can kind of help alleviate some of these technique issues. Another barrier commonly listed by folks would be that, what is the evidence for internal medicine? We have tons of evidence for critical care for emergency medicine, but we don't have that for internal medicine, either for it as a clinical tool or even really as an educational tool. An example of such a study came out in 2017 where a group of researchers looked at whether or not ultrasound is useful. Now, mind you, this is not internal medicine. This is in the undergraduate medical education setting, which is for medical students. They did a systematic review looking at how useful point of care ultrasound is in improving students' diagnostic accuracy. Um, and they summarized their findings as follows. With ultrasound, with POCUS, students' diagnostic accuracy was improved for certain pathologies, but not for others. So the findings were inconsistent, which led them to conclude that the following, as the value of clinical ultrasound used by medical students remains unproven, educators must consider whether or not the associated financial and temporal costs are justified or whether or not more research is required. So with that, I, I don't disagree that the studies are inconsistent and sometimes ultrasound shows it's helpful. Sometimes ultrasound shows that it's not helpful. But what I would argue uh, is the following. Ultrasound education or even clinical ultrasound, point of care ultrasound is not like taking a pill. It's not like I deliver a consistent pill of education to all my learners and that the intervention is going to be the same everywhere else. I think that what we need to really think about is that the complexity of point of care ultrasound and education is such that we need to ask more sophisticated questions, such as when is point of care ultrasound useful? Under what circumstances, under what settings is it useful? And when is it not useful? So I think that, um, you know, with, with asking more complex questions rather than does ultrasound help education, uh, we can probably advance the field a lot more. 
With respect to the second point of the researcher about whether or not more research is required, I think it's fair to say that more research is always required. And anytime you have something new, such as point of care ultrasound, really in terms of internal medicine hasn't been around that long. Absolutely, we need to spend a lot more effort into use, um, studying how it can help internists. I'm going to go back to my initial point, uh, my enthusiasm for ultrasound delivering additional data points for us. I'm going to hamper our enthusiasm by adding the, the uh, following comment, that more data isn't always better, and that poor technique and knowledge can really dramatically impact on our accuracy of using point of care to help our patients. That IVC example I gave you kind of illustrated um, to you some of the issues regarding technique um, that can impact on patient care. I'm going to also talk now a little bit about um, some of the creative ways of getting around it. And here's an example. Let's say we wanted to assess whether our patient at the bedside has a large spleen, an enlarged spleen. So you can either spend the time really getting a very good view of the spleen and making sure you're not measuring the false axis, long axis of the spleen and, uh, uh, and me measuring it accurately. Um, you know, you can, you can try to teach all your internal medicine colleagues and learners how to do this properly and make sure that they're really not foreshortening the spleen. Alternatively, you can think of different ways of evaluating. One of the things that I really am a firm believer in is that internal medicine ultrasound isn't simply an attempt to replicate what our imaging specialists and what our other colleagues are doing. Um, I don't necessarily think that spending hours and hours trading on measuring spleen length is necessarily in the best interest of our practice because we don't necessarily have that time. Uh, what we proposed here in this study, this was a study that, was, um, that we published um, recently on the use of assessing for the spleen. What if we were to use the ultrasound to complement what we're actually doing at the bedside? Some of you may be familiar with the use of Castell sign um, for the evaluation of splenomegaly. And that cast Castell sign involves percussing over this region, over this region where we ask the patient to inspire. And as the spleen descends, uh, the inspiratory note, the percussion note on that, um, on the, on that site would change from being resonant to dull as the spleen descends. So our thought was, what if we were to put a transducer over the exact site that would be evaluating the spleen, how would that impact on our diagnostic accuracy at the bedside? So that this is what we would look like. Mind you, this is a, a curvilinear probe rather than the uh, phased array that I showed in a picture earlier, but the sentiment is essentially the same. So let's assume this is over the Castell region that you would normally percuss. Um, right now it's full of bow. And so the note, if you were to percuss, would be resonant. Oops, let me just go back, sorry. Would be resonant. But um, if you get the patient to inspire, you would find that as the spleen descends, you would be able to visualize the spleen, which would correspond to the presence of dullness over this region. This is probably fairly intuitive and it's not really earth groundbreaking here, but what we were able to find, however, that while our physical examination technique had a sensitivity of 83%, specificity of 71, with the use of ultrasound, we increased our sensitivity to 92%, just under 92% and specificity of 85.7. Our likelihood ratio, uh, positive likelihood ratio similarly increased and our negative likelihood ratio similarly decreased. So this has led to our proposal of how we think ultrasound could be used at the bedside to look for a splenomegaly, not necessarily to replace it because point of care ultrasound does take a little bit longer in that I'd have to bring the machine in and I don't necessarily want to do that for everybody. But if I have a um, positive traditional Castell's method and the palpation is positive, I probably can be fair to conclude that the patient has a high likelihood for a splenomegaly. However, if my, uh, my um, traditional physical examination technique is negative, 
adding the sonographic Castell sign will allow me to pick up additional uh, splenomegaly that are present. So this is how we propose that uh, ultrasound use could be integrated into our current physical examination. We need to be aware of pitfalls. Technique issue I went over. Airfree finding in ultrasound has both positives and false negatives and it's imperative that we're trained in fully rec recognizing all the potential pitfalls of that. The third pitfall is patient comorbidities. And the last one is that our patients often come in with multiple diagnoses. They don't just come in with pneumonia. They come in with pneumonia precipitated their congestive heart failure or their congestive, congestive heart failure also precipitating their, uh, exacerbating their COPD. Comorbidities, here's an example of a patient with um, IPF or idiopathic, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If they came in with shortness of breath and I see irregularity of their pleura, so this is a rib here, rib here, rib space, rib space, B lines, um, all the way down here. I'm not sure that um, unless we know what the baseline of this patient's lung ultrasound looks like, I'm not sure that we can come up with a lot of conclusion as to what's causing the patient's shortness of breath at this time. I think there is a natural tendency uh, for our learners to see these findings and say irregularity and beelines, maybe the patient's got an infective process, but recognizing the baseline comorbidities is absolutely critical as most of our patients have a number of comorbidities that will need to be taken into account as their baseline ultrasound findings are very different from that of a normal patient. The next point I want to comment on as a barrier is that sometimes people don't understand that there are different uses of point of care ultrasound for internal medicine. I kind of alluded to the fact that point of care ultrasound may be useful as an educational technique to teach people better uh, uh, understanding physiology, anatomy, physical examination techniques. And then there's the clinical realm. Uh, within clinical realm, it's either procedural or non-procedurally based. Procedures I don't think anyone debates with us on, on why we should be using ultrasound, but non-procedure is where I'm going to spend a bit more time because I think there's a fair amount of confusion as to whether or not point of care ultrasound should be used to augment your examination or to make diagnoses. And I think how you, how you use ultrasound, whether to augment or to diagnose, makes a big difference into whether or not you are willing to use point of care ultrasound. Let me illustrate what the differences are between these two entities with the following example. Let's say you're suspecting the patient has pleural effusion at the bedside um, and physical examination techniques that we may perform would be looking for excursion, the chest, ex uh, chest, chest expansion and tactile fremitus. Based on the evidence-based physical diagnosis, the most recent addition uh, from Dr. McGee, the positive likelihood ratio of an presence of an asymmetric chest expansion has an 8.1 positive likelihood ratio, reduced tactile fremitus 5.7. So it, the presence of an asymmetry um, in your chest expansion really increases your likelihood of having pleural effusion significantly. But that all depends on how likely you think the patient had pleural eff effusion in the first place. So let's assume our pretest probability, and this is a Fagan normal gram, where you apply the likelihood ratio of approximately eight to a pretest probability of let's say 10 in, a, in this given patient, it would then subsequently lead you to a post-test probability of somewhere between 50 and 60%. What that means is after I find asymmetric chest expansion, I'm not necessarily going to come away from the patient thinking for sure if this patient has pleural effusion, you're going to need additional um, diagnostic imaging to confirm that. If, however, on the other hand, we see this with the ultrasound here, what we have here is pleural effusion with the spine sign, diaphragm here, um, 
uh, either liver or spleen is difficult to tell from this view. What we see is hypoanechoic uh, pleural effusion along with consolidated lung over here. If we see the presence of pleural effusion on lung ultrasound, it Based on the existing literature, this is a study that was a systematic review that was studied, uh, published in 2016. The presence of pleural effusion on ultrasound has a positive likelihood ratio of 54. Okay, so that's extremely good. Now, if I was to use point of care ultrasound to augment my diagnosis, what that would inherently say is that I have a pretest probability of 10, applying a likelihood ratio of 56. I now walk away with a post-test probability of 90 plus percent. That i.e. there's an over 90 percent probability that this patient I just saw has a pleural effusion. This is how augmentation using point of care ultrasound to augment um, would be used. If on the other hand you want to use ultrasound as a diagnostic tool, then you're saying essentially that your patient has 100% certainty that because I saw pleural effusion, I'm 100% certain that the patient has pleural effusion. I think for internists to really use point of care ultrasound thoughtfully um, and in a way that that would be more acceptable with, to them, I would highly recommend the use of ultrasound to change your pre-test and post-test probability, because really at the end of the day, there are false positive and false negatives with many of our ultrasound findings. Having said that, some of them, some of these findings may look quite slam dunk, but at the same time, I think there is some value in being a little bit more prudent. Uh, and really a post-test probability of 90% is a pretty good one. The last comment I want to make is that sometimes we folks fail to appreciate that our internal medicine POCUS is in some ways quite different from POCUS in other specialties. And by that, I mean we start using data from other specialties to apply it in our clinical setting. I, have a, uh, I had a patient that on the consult service, this is a patient that had a uh, total knee replacement surgery, and we were consulted for postoperative tachycardia. So at the bedside, we performed um, a, I don't have the clips here, but we performed a cardiac scan and a lung scan. The lung looked entirely normal in all the zones that we interrogated. The cardiac scan showed no evidence of a dilated uh, right ventricle. Um, the, there is presence of tachycardia, but the, there's negative McConnell sign. We went on to do a DVT scan as well on this patient. And lo and behold, we found nothing. So you have a greater savinous vein going into the, uh, uh, the femoral vein here and that they compressed uh, quite nicely. There's no evidence of DVT. We went on further through the various areas all the way to the bifurcation, as well as looking at the popliteal area. So I think with all the very reassuring findings, normal lung, normal cardiac, normal negative DVT scan, there was for some reason, a high tendency for our learners to walk away and say, well, we're now less worried about PE and DVT. What we can't do is that we can't apply the existing literature to rule out conditions in our internal medicine patient. So this is a study systematic review that came out in 2013, uh, looking at 16 studies. If you look at the um, diagnostic utility of point of care ultrasound for ruling out DV DVTs, you'll find a negative likelihood ratio that's actually quite good. It's a highly sensitive and highly specific test. However, this is for the emergency medicine population. These studies do not apply to the patient who is post-operative knee lying on the ward for a number of days and having developed tachycardia. So in the end, our patient that had a completely normal point of care ultrasound um, did have a PE because we cannot use point of care ultrasound to falsely reassure us that nothing ominous might be going on in a patient who had a high pretest probability of pulmonary embolus. So what can internists do? 
Um, obviously, there are many ways to, to advance point of care ultrasound for internal medicine. I can only comment on what we've done in Canada in our group. We met in 2016. We had a large number of folks across the country get together. And we decided up front that we did not want to introduce anything and everything under the sun for point of care ultrasound. Instead, we wanted to focus on a few elements and we wanted to focus on teaching this well. And to that end, we had um, four applications that we thought would be very reasonable for residents who are in their first to third year of residency training for them to learn and three procedures for them to master. And for those in higher level of training, we introduce additional seven applications that might be reasonable for them and four um, uh, procedures that would be reason reasonable for them to learn. And the bottom line is that uh, rather than trying to learn everything and um, as much as you know all the applications out there, it may be more helpful to really do a few things, but do that very well. So with that, I'm going to end. The take home messages really are as follows. I really do think internists should use point of care ultrasound. I think the ability to actually gather additional data points is extremely helpful. There's no arguing that we really should be guiding uh, needles into pockets um, with, you know, with the use of ultrasound. It helps improve our physical examination techniques and it's great for teaching. The barriers that I've cited for internists not using point of care ultrasound can really be overcome, really. I think that with practice, we can be better at our technique and we do need to be knowledgeable and have an understanding of various uses of point of care ultrasound including the limitations and pitfalls that are associated with it. And thirdly, I think we do need to be a bit more creative. We can't just necessarily replicate what uh, intensivists and emergency doctors are doing. Their patients are sicker. Their pretest probability for some of these conditions are actually higher in some settings and lower in others. So what we should do as internists is that we really should start small um, and where there's no evidence, create and evaluate and see where things go from there. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation. We are very, very excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Irene. I will speak in Spanish for a while, okay? Bueno, pues de verdad que estamos muy, muy contentos y muy agradecidos por la extraordinaria exposición que nos ha dado la doctora Irene. Un fabuloso resumen de, de cuál es la utilidad en, los, eh, en, en la medicina interna del ultrasonido point of care. Como ustedes han visto, bueno, estamos muy acostumbrados al ultrasonido point of care en, el área, en áreas críticas, en el área de urgencias, quizás en el perioperatorio, en la anestesiología. Pero esto realmente es fascinante, cómo integrando el ultrasonido point of care a, a un programa de, de medicina interna resulta verdaderamente increíble la utilidad. Desde luego, tomando en cuenta lo que ha comentado la doctora sobre limitaciones, pitfalls y demás, que, que desde luego es muy importante, sobre todo cuando menciona que el conocimiento y, y las limitaciones deben de, de ir acompañando a todo aquel que trata de integrar esta fabulosa herramienta en su práctica clínica. Y pues de verdad es, es fabuloso ver cómo eh, en, en medicina interna se integran otros aspectos que no son tan comúnmente tomados en cuenta en la ultrasonografía crítica o de urgencias, como es el, 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 el tema de las articulaciones, como es el tema de, la, de los procedimientos como paracentesis, etcétera, que son de gran utilidad para el médico internista y sobre todo de cómo, eh, de acuerdo a lo que la doctora nos recomienda eh, en esta charla y desde luego en sus recomendaciones de cómo ir integrando algunos tópicos específicos a lo largo del currículum y la formación de los médicos internistas resulta fascinante. Yo tengo una, una pregunta para la doctora. I have a question for you, a question for you Irene. In your opinion, uh, the point of care has a pocos, pocos. Uh, uh, does impact the mortality in, in in that kind of patients? In your opinion, POCOS really impacts the the mortality in the patients. Is there some literature about this, or what's your opinion about the impact in the mortality uh, with this tool, Irene? Uh, 
Um, I, that's an excellent question as to how it impacts care of the patient. Um, literature for that is not strong. And the reasons for the literature not being strong is that it's a very difficult thing to prove um, and it requires large multinational studies with very, very big sample size in order to prove that uh, the ability of it to actually improve mortality. Um, and secondly, uh, it does to do a trial like that requires a very focused topic. It, it can't just be general use of ultrasound by all practitioners in, in all various levels, whether they use it well or use it poorly. Um, and, and the intervention has to be a bit more uniform. So the difficulty why internal medicine hasn't come up with a ton of studies on this yet has to do with the fact that A, we don't have enough practitioners skilled enough to deliver the same intervention across the board. And secondly, our our diagnoses have to be a bit more uniform so that we can potentially study one disease at a time. Having said that, um, I don't necessarily, I, I do believe that point of care ultrasound does have mortality benefits in that, um, or at least outcome benefit in that it does benefit patient care, but maybe it is more incumbent upon interns to study the more proximal outcome, meaning we study uh, some, of the, some of the evidence of less readmissions or fewer uh, shorter time, uh, longer time to readmissions. Uh, and uh, some of these other outcomes would be a bit more feasible to start. Um, now, secondly, the other comment I might want to comment on would be that point of care ultrasound um, in some ways is, is similar to using history and physical, is an assessment tool. Um, does it absolutely need to impact mortality for it to be useful? I would argue that it doesn't, um, but certainly the few times that we're able to detect a life-changing um, outcome difference is, is impactful on all of us. And, but for that to show statistical benefit is a, is a higher bar. But I think the data will come. It just takes a bit more time for that to come along. Exactly. Thank you, Aileen. Eh, Pavel, no sé si quisieras comentar algún, algo eh, antes de, pasa, de buscar eh, preguntas de la audiencia. No sé si tuvieras algún comentario o algunas preguntas, Pavel. Claro que sí. Eh, creo que un aspecto importante que comenta la doctora Irene es Precisamente el ser muy prudente es la interpretación de las imágenes que nosotros estamos viendo. Una vez que nosotros estamos eh, metidos ya y utilizamos la ecografía como una herramienta clínica, como médicos internistas, habrá que ser muy prudentes en lo que uno está interpretando. Y hay que tener claro que eh, no cambia el razonamiento clínico. El uso de la ecografía no viene a cambiar nuestro razonamiento clínico. Lo que viene a hacer es reforzar Sí, nuestras posibilidades diagnósticas y nos ayudan a tomar decisiones más oportunas en cuanto al tratamiento. Es decir, hay que tener muy claro eso, nuestro razonamiento clínico no va a cambiar. Eso viene, como todos lo sabemos, dado por la historia clínica, los antecedentes, la presentación clínica, pero sí viene a darnos un plus eh, eso, muy importante y de mucho peso en cuanto a el, la um, sensibilidad o las posibilidades diagnósticas, ser más certeros en nuestros diagnósticos y desde luego la toma de decisiones en el tratamiento de nuestros pacientes. Creo que eso es muy, muy, muy atinado de, de su parte. Así es, y como bien mencionas, eh, la parte de clínica eh, de integrar todo lo que es eh, los métodos tradicionales de interrogatorio, de exploración, y esto eh, como una herramienta adicional a todo lo que normalmente hacemos, y me llama mucho la atención lo que comenta sobre las, lim las limitaciones eh, que sí pueden en un momento dado impactar en el abordaje de los pacientes. Por eso es tan importante la formación de, de los médicos en este aspecto. Una buena enseñanza, el tratar de que esto sea eh, de alguna manera estandarizado con profesores desde luego capacitados. Creo que es muy importante porque menciona la parte de, de que se pueden llegar a tomar malas decisiones cuando no hay una, una correcta formación porque no se están interpretando adecuadamente las imágenes. Entonces va desde la parte, desde el background teórico que el 
médico debe de tener sobre la herramienta y sobre la patología y todavía agregarle al ser una herramienta operador dependiente, pues la parte técnica, ¿no? Y luego ya después de obtener unas eh, adecuadas imágenes, bueno, viene todo lo que es la interpretación y contextualizarlo a, a todo lo que es el aspecto clínico y el, el, lo, que, lo que viene alrededor de, de los pacientes. Creo que realmente es increíble, es, es fascinante la manera en cómo la doctora nos ha, nos ha eh, descrito los puntos que son sumamente importantes en, en los, para los médicos internistas al utilizar esta, esta herramienta. Eh, si tuvieran en la audiencia alguna, alguna pregunta antes de concluir el, el webinario, pues este es el momento de, de hacerla. Eh, no sé, eh, Pavel, algún otro, algún otro comentario respecto a los, a los proyectos que se tienen de, de realizar un curso para médicos internistas. No sé si quisieras aterrizar algo con la, con la doctora Irene. Y yo te, sí, Juan, yo te me gustaría que pudieras traducir, por favor. Sí. Tengo va varias uh -huh. preguntas interesantes, sin lugar a dudas. Ahí me gustaría saber eh, cuál es la postura en, en Canadá. Creo que es de los pocos países que tiene claro y tiene ya un programa de formación para el médico internista que incluye ya la ecografía. Pero me gustaría saber cuál es la postura en Canadá de los médicos radiólogos y de uh -huh. los ecocardiografistas eh, en relación al uso de esta herramienta por parte de médicos internistas, desde luego médicos no radiólogos. También en Canadá hay un programa de ecografía para médicos familiares y para hospitalistas. Entonces me gustaría saber cuál es esa, la, qué, qué posición tienen esos especialistas allá en, en Canadá. Aquí sabemos que, que nos ha costado mucho, mucho trabajo, que en muchas ocasiones no es bien visto que un médico no radiólogo o un no ecocardiografista tome, tome un, un ultrasonido. Me gustaría saber su, su opinión. Claro. Uh, Irene, I'm going to translate you. It's a very, very important question. Uh, Pavel uh, is questioning about the opinion of uh, other physicians, such as cardiologists or, or radiologists. I think, what is their opinion about the using of ultrasound by non-radiologist physicians? I think, what is the, the point of view of those physicians about the use of focus with uh, by internist I think that's a really, really good question. I think it varies depending on where you practice and it even varies within the department uh, itself. For instance, within the department of radiology or in, in our centers called diagnostic imaging, we have a lot of support from them. Uh, in that uh, they, they are very willing to help us out uh, with developing our curriculum and providing advice and, and support as needed. Uh, within cardiology, we also have representatives from them. But having said that, I can't say that you know, both of these departments uniformly support what we're doing. Um, I think one of the things that we're always going to run into trouble with is a lack of dialogue. If there's no dialogue with the, these uh, imaging specialists, then I don't think they understand what, we're, what it is that we're trying to do. It's very important for them, I think, to, for them to understand that we're not replicating what we're doing. Um, by no means do I walk around saying that, you know, my, my ultrasound of the heart is a full echocardiogram, but I think having them involved um, and what we did in Calgary is that we involved them very early on so that if there are problems along the way, we can troubleshoot together and grow together as this is a very new experience. But yes, I, I can fully appreciate that, um, you know, it's, it's not always smooth sailing and it won't be always smooth sailing, but uh, a discussion is absolutely critically needed. And the last point I want to comment on is the fact that uh, most of the associations are fully endorsing point of care ultrasound. Um, if you look at the Canadian Radiology Association, they do have a statement of support um, and similarly with the cardiologists as well. Fantástico. Eh, Pavel, no sé si lo, lo alcanzaste a entender, sobre todo lo que dice al final de cómo ahí mismo eh, algunos, eh, particularmente radiólogos, tienen una postura incluso de apoyo al, al uso y el enfoque que es justamente se le está dando. Y vaya, no es 
diferente a lo que hemos comentado que también sucede en México y que debemos de hacer, de tratar de involucrar, sobre todo de manera temprana, como dice la doctora, a otros especialistas, sobre todo si se tienen ciertas dudas. Y luego, y pues bueno, tratar de ir, ir mediando e ir involucrándolos para que también ellos conozcan cuál es nuestro, nuestro punto de vista, ya que en algunas situaciones específicas, como lo hemos comentado infinidad de veces, pues es un enfoque eh, muy, muy específico para responder algunas preguntas, eh, especialmente en el escenario de, eh, agudo, etc. Eh, eh, no sé, Pablo, si tuvieras algún otro, algún otro comentario, alguna otra pregunta. Sí, Juan, eh, puedes traducir, por favor. Eh, me gustaría saber, hemos leído detenidamente el consenso que ha mostrado la doctora en, 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 su, en sus diapositivas. Este consenso resulta muy interesante. Fueron más de 38 miembros, expertos, internistas, todos, que se juntaron y tomaron las decisiones en relación a cuáles son las competencias que debe tener, eh, dependiendo del grado de, del residente. ¿sí? Me gustaría eh, saber si actualmente es obligatoria, es decir, existe en todo el país este consenso o se llevan todas estas recomendaciones que hacen ya integrado en el currículum de los residentes de medicina interna o es opcional en algunas instituciones, es decir, ya es formal o sigue siendo opcional. Exacto. I, I'll translate to you. Uh, Pavel is questioning about if this consensus, uh, speaking about your recommendations and your consensus, uh, is it mandatory for all the physicians, the internal medicine residents or internal medicine physicians, uh, the point of care ultrasound uh, into the, the education of internal medicine residency? Or this is only partial, or only uh, one part of the of the physicians are including point of care ultrasound. Um, we call it the recommended curriculum. We currently cannot make it mandatory because every mm. institution across Canada would be at different stages of where they are with point of care ultrasound. Some are still actively acquiring machines, so we can't currently call it mandatory but mm. my hope is one day many of these items would be considered mandatory it would be similar to all physicians should be able to evaluate the jugular vein all physicians should be able to auscultate the heart so it is mm. my hope that one day it becomes mandatory but we're not there yet Exactly. Sí, eh, Pavel, que ahorita actualmente no es obligatorio, que esperamos que en algún momento lo sea, pero ella no lo llamanda, no lo manda, eh, lo llamaría actualmente como obligatorio esta, esta herramienta, es, es sobre todo respecto al consenso. Y pues bueno, parece que también hay algunas preguntas de, de la audiencia. Eh, alguien por ahí también está preguntando sobre la formación de, de pediatras, si en, en Canadá existe también la formación de point of care ultrasound para pediatras. Irene, uh, some physicians from the audience are questioning about the possibility to include this curriculum or, or this education or these programs to the pediatricians in, in pediatrics. What do you think about it? I'm not a pediatrics by train, pediatrician by training, but I would highly recommend it because I think um, kids are even more harmed by radiation. So mm. the benefit of ultrasound is even greater. So I would highly support and endorse the use of point of care ultrasound for pediatrics. Absolutely. Exacto. Sí, nos comenta que desde luego que, que ella lo recomienda muchísimo, ya que el proteger a los chiquillos de la, de la radiación pues resulta sumamente importante. Eh, bueno, nos preguntan dónde acceder a, del, eh, en el, eh, al consenso que ha publicado el grupo de la doctora. Está desde luego en línea, lo tenemos en nuestra, en nuestra promoción. Tenemos el link que lleva a, este, a, a esta publicación. De todos modos, eh, al final vamos a incluirla en los comentarios de Facebook. Ahí vamos a incluir el, el link para que puedan accesar específicamente a, a, este, a este artículo. Eh, no sé, Pavel, ¿algún otro comentario, alguna otra pregunta? Sí, mira, quiero, quiero aprovechar que tenemos a, a la doctora Irene, uh -huh. una, una, toda una autoridad en la cuestión del, del FUCUS en medicina interna. Y ahí me gustaría saber la, la opinión que tiene. Ya estamos... Contar esta evidencia que ha mostrado en su, en su presentación con todo lo que nos ha explicado y todo lo que nosotros hemos podido 
eh, aprender en este, en este tiempo que estamos enfocados en el uso de esta herramienta, en nuestra práctica clínica, estamos realmente eh, ante la muerte del, del estetoscopio como una herramienta o parte del armamentario que tenemos como, como médicos, es decir, estamos próximo a eso, vamos a colgar el estetoscopio en algún momento y va a quedar olvidado. Mm -hmm. Claro. I mean, uh, in your opinion, um, is there still a place for for a stethoscope in your clinical or daily practice? This is a very common question. Yes. Because there are a lot of physicians questions because actually there, there is a kind of debate, in, in, you know, in using or not you or still using the stethoscope. Uh, I have, of course, a, a personal point of view, but I would like to hear from you your opinion, Irene. Absolutely. I'm actually, believe it or not, very old school. So I firmly believe that the more tools, the better. I will never use ultrasound to replace my stethoscope, and I'll give you the reason why. One, mm -hmm. I will never hear a wheeze on an ultrasound, okay? Because I cannot detect bronchospasm with an ultrasound. Two, however good ultrasound is at looking at valvular pathologies, I do not have the time and I'm not going to apply Doppler to every valve that I see in the heart. So without having listened for murmurs, I don't know which valve to even look at. So it is absolutely imperative that we keep as internists our physical exam skills as great as we can so that we can use ultrasound better. And that's my personal opinion. And I recognize there's a lot of dissension out there. Exactly. Pavel, es, es, no sé si le lo alcanzaste a entender. Realmente ella dice que no, no, lo, no recomienda, o al menos desde su punto de vista, reemplazar el estetoscopio, que entre más herramientas es mucho mejor integrar más herramientas para lograr un diagnóstico, sobre todo hablando de lo que se ha comentado mucho sobre las sibilancias y los soplos, ¿no? en el caso de la, de la cardiología, que muchas veces no tenemos ni la herramienta, quizás ni la formación para, para utilizar el Doppler avanzado, etc., eh, pues ella sigue recomendando como parte de la exploración clínica eh, pues todo lo que sabemos más el, el estetoscopio desde luego y sobre todo el ultrasonido como un complemento que bueno en, también desde mi punto de vista yo comparto esa opinión porque no siempre tenemos a la mano todo listo para el ultrasonido a pesar de, de como ella también lo ha comentado en su, en su charla de que cada vez afortunadamente es más accesible el ultrasonido la máquina tanto por los costos que se han abaratado por, por, los, por el material que se está utilizando, que ya es más barato, como la portabilidad, etcétera. Entonces, sí, efectivamente podemos cada vez utilizarlo en escenarios eh, más, más difíciles, por decirlo así, pero desde mi punto de vista también el estetoscopio todavía tiene un, una cierta utilidad. Eh, y bueno, pues desde luego el debate sigue, sigue abierto, eh, pero bueno, esa es la, la opinión de la, de la doctora este, Pavel. No sé si quieras comentar algo más. Bien, creo que eh, pues nos confirma verdad lo que comentábamos al inicio. Eh, no va a cambiar nuestro razonamiento clínico. Es una herramienta que nos permite tener mayor certeza diagnóstica y desde luego tomar decisiones importantes al cuanto al tratamiento de nuestros pacientes. Precisamente pues en este marco me gustaría invitar ¿verdad? a los médicos internistas y todos los médicos interesados que empiecen a revisar, empiecen a utilizar esta herramienta, que se acerquen para poder... Eh, pues conocer de todo el, el beneficio que tiene el uso de, del, ultrasonora, del ultrasonido en, a, a pie de cama, ¿no? la ecología clínica que llaman los, los españoles. Y precisamente, pues Juan, invitarlos. Nuestra asociación ha estado ya, eh, tiene un tiempo ya eh, diseñando un curso, precisamente tomando esos aspectos importantes que ha comentado la doctora Irene. Nos hemos basado en su consenso, en el consenso también del grupo español de la Sociedad eh, de Medicina Interna. Estamos próximos en el mes de mayo a llevar a cabo nuestro primer curso aquí en nuestra sede de Guadalajara. Las fechas estarán publicando y ojalá puedan, puedan acompañarnos. Exacto, Pavel. I mean, we are speaking about, we are designing a, an internal medicine course. Of course, we, we would like to insert 
uh, all the topics about internal medicine, or focus internal medicine as you did in your consensus, not only in a course, we would like to, to integrate all of those topics, not only in a course, but, uh, but also in an extended program of residencies. It would, it would be very, very nice. However, we, we have to start <laughs> with something and we would like to start with a, a course, maybe two, two days, integrating all of those topics that you mentioned in your consensus. That's why, as I mentioned in this afternoon, your consensus is very, very useful for us because uh, it uh, is very, very interesting. And, and this and your consensus um, mentions all of those main topics that we have to integrate in internal medicine, in focus internal medicine. Uh, well, uh, Irene, I don't know if you have a, a last uh, message for our Mexican and Latin American audience, Irene. I think my last message, aside from thanking you for involving me, <laughs> it really is like honestly i think internal medicine ultrasound is so valuable my last message i guess to 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 your audience would be to keep practicing and learning as much as you can there is so much utility of using point of care ultrasound and it is does feel like an uphill battle it takes a lot of work and it takes time but don't give up you guys are in a fantastic place um you know, everyone across the world is in the same position. So right. keep up that excellent work. I'm very delighted to hear that you're developing the course for your residency training. That is so exciting. And I congratulate you guys on the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y pues bueno, eh, pues esto es prácticamente todo. Como dice Pavel, pues invitarlos a los cursos que tendremos próximamente. Y bueno, pues aquí Pavel nos ha dado la primicia de que eh, pronto tendremos en nuestra asociación un curso dirigido específicamente para médicos internistas. Seguramente habrá otros cursos para otras áreas en específico pero ya estamos planeando un curso para médicos internistas que se va a llevar a cabo, como dice Pablo, en mayo en Guadalajara y desde luego que podrá difundirse en toda la República en los grupos que también lo soliciten, ¿no, Pavel? Así es. Nuestro primer curso va a ser en mayo aquí en Guadalajara. Estén atentos a las fechas con la intención de llevarlo a diferentes partes de, de la República como lo hemos hecho con nuestros demás, demás cursos. Así es, Pablo. Bueno, pues agradecerle a la doctora Irene por de verdad por estar con nosotros, porque eh, ha sido extraordinaria su ponencia. Y recordarles que esta eh, plática pues se queda en el, en el sitio de Facebook para poder visualizarse en cualquier momento y en cualquier lugar. Y que desde luego también a los que se integraron a, a través a la conferencia a través de la plataforma Zoom tendrán su constancia por parte del Consejo Mexicano de Medicina Crítica. Agradecerte, Pavel, por tu tiempo también, por hasta, habernos acompañado. Gracias por, por, por estar aquí. Thank you so much, Irene. Thank you, thank you. We are really, really happy. Uh, I'm going to finish the, the webinar. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you for spending part of your time with us. We are very, very excited. And um, see you hopefully someday in Mexico as well. <laughs> Would love to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Bye, bye. bye, -bye. Hasta luego a todos. Adiós a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos. Hasta luego.